Amen. I guarantee you, I'm a lot more proud to be here than where I was last Sunday. The Lord will be merciful to me. I hope I learned my lesson, whatever it was. I think I got it, Lord. Amen. But it's good to see everybody here. Good looking crowd today. We've got some that are on the road and they should be back tonight, I think. And then we've got some battling sickness and and different different uh, situations, but uh, pray for folks, okay? When you come in here and pray, let me tell you something else too. We the first twelve hour prayer, we had twenty people sign up. Twenty people prayed an hour. The second time we had eighteen. The third time we had thirteen or fourteen. Y'all get the idea of what I'm getting at? we should at least maintain. Besides, it makes a difference. And it's, it's the quickest hour you'll ever spend in prayer. Yes, ma'am. There you go. And coming to the church, there's something about coming to the church to pray. And if you sign up for the, for the afternoon session, this place has done been saturated. You can feel the presence of the Lord as soon as you start praying. It's here. It's, it certainly is. I love to come and pray between 6 and 7. The Holy Ghost, he's an early riser. Amen. So if you can at all, when we do it again in December, and I know we'll have to work around the holidays, but we're not going to try to work around them too much. Because he's, he's not just the reason for the season. He's the reason that I'm even alive. And God forbid that I'd ever put some junk before him. Because most of the things we're going to buy for our kids is junk anyway. Amen. Right? So uh, uh, I, I would encourage you. I would encourage you. Find somebody to be a blessing to this year. Not just as our church, but, but when you're uh, fighting through the crowd on Black Friday, I know what it's called. Praise the Lord. I've been, I've been, had that revelation. It's not Fabulous Friday, it's Black Friday. But when you're fighting the crowd to get you a dolly or a microwave or a coffee maker that you don't really need, but you're just getting because it's on sale, look around for somebody that ain't got much. Pay for somebody's food. Sister Stacy. Right. All right, so if you were planning on helping with the baskets, just make a donation. It will go in the benevolence fund. That You don't even have to do any shopping. If you was going to buy a can of cranberry sauce, just give Sister Stacy $2 and we'll call it even. I don't know if that's what they cost or not, but that sounds like a good price. Romans chapter number 10. Let me just tell you something. This whole lesson today is about growing. This whole message is about growing. And as you grow in the Lord, as those light bulbs begin to go off, your relationship with God is going to be enriched beyond your wildest imagination. Okay? Beyond your wildest imagination, your relationship is going to be enriched. When you realize that it has absolutely, I mean, your relationship with God has nothing to do with feeling. You start talking, now I'm, I'm going to get into the word right now, but you go read the Old Testament, how they would go seven years, 40 years, never hear from God. Not only Brother David, were they, they weren't feeling him, they never were privileged to feel what we feel anyway. But Brother Robbie, they didn't even hear from him. But they just kept going. Job said, he, he, he confessed. I don't see him nowhere. I don't, he's, far as I know, he's left me. 
but I'm going to keep my God. I'm just going to keep on going the way I've been going. I'm going to keep on heading. This is where we got to get, saints of God, is no matter what goes on in our life, our walk with God. You, you know something? I came, Brother Doyle, I came to a great revelation this past week. The Spirit don't get sick. Listen to me. The Spirit don't get old. So if you get the Holy Ghost when you're six, when you're 96, the Spirit is just as strong as it was the day you got it. It, it just was unbelieving to me when I realized that the power of the Holy Ghost is not subject to your physical status. How many of you remember the story of Brother Johnny Goder laying hands on that lady and she being healed of cancer and while he had cancer? He was laying down in his office, sick as a dog, bad sick. This lady didn't have cancer. She had something less than that wrong with her. And they come, got him out of the office and said, so-and-so needs prayer. All the way out there, he's thinking, you got to be kidding me. Here I am about to die, and they're coming asking me for prayer. I need prayer. Say, ah, oh, don't, we're just humans. So he come out there, Brother Robin, he laid hands on that lady and prayed for her, and God healed him and her both. He lifted up his hands and began to jump up and down, say, I'm healed of cancer. He's still living today. Lord just raised him up here a couple weeks ago. There is... Some stuff that the Lord wants to show you and me. But we have got to get past the emotional aspect of it. We think that he only works when we're riding high. Now hear me right now. We think that he only is doing a good job when we're not facing any hell. Huh? You, let me tell you something. I am begging. I am pleading. I am just short of hog time, people, coming and going door to door, knocking on doors between 6 and 7 on Wednesday nights to remind you to come to the house of God. If you're not coming on Wednesday nights, you are missing out. I will never forget what Brother David brought to us Wednesday night as long as I live. Never. As... Anytime I start going through a valley, I'm going to remember that word. Let me tell you something. I'm going to say this again. The Lord laid it on my heart while he was bringing the word. If you're praying, if you're fasting, if you're giving your tithes and offerings like you're supposed to, like the book says, if you're being faithful to the house of God, if you're reading your Bible, doing everything you're supposed to do, and you're still going through terrible trials, it ain't you just rejoice because God's taking you somewhere. But if you're not doing everything you know to do, and you're going through a trial, you need to get yourself fixed first. Roger, I'm going to write that down somewhere and put my name beside it because that's pretty powerful. Thank you, Brother David. When we're going through something, it's one of two things. We're wrong. We got something wrong in our life or God's trying to do something with us. One of two things. Romans chapter 10, verse number 1. Brethren, anytime Paul says brethren, who's he talking to? Church folks, let me tell you this again. Remember it. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It's the biography where we learn about Jesus Christ. The book of Acts. It's where we learn how to be saved. Romans through Jude. We learn how to stay saved. And then Revelation. We learn why we need to be saved. What we need to be saved from eventually. And what we need to be saved to Romans, brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record 
that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness. Now, I know this is something that I say often, but I'm going to keep saying it. I got a paper in the mail this week that said repetition and even to the point of being redundant is beneficial to the church. Ignorance is not an ugly word. To call someone ignorant in our society has come up to be some kind of ugly, like you're calling them that they're stupid. That's not the case. Ignorance is simply a lack of knowledge. For instance, if I get on an airplane and the pilot dies of a heart attack and I get my chance to be a hero, guess what? It's going to have to be God because I am totally ignorant about what it takes to fly a jet airplane. Right? Ignorance is simply a lack of knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness or what is right in the eyes of God and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. Israel's God's chosen people. They were promised to Abraham, Brother Rice, to be a people. They were created to fulfill that promise. Abraham was called out of his father's house in order to establish a house for the people of God. Let's find just a little bit of the background of Paul's writings here. Romans 9 and 1 through 5 says, I say the truth in Christ, I lie not. My conscience also bear me witness in the Holy Ghost. My words and my thoughts are the same thing. That I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. For I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren my kinsmen according to the flesh. Paul was a Jew. He was called to preach the gospel to the Gentiles. But he's letting us know here, Brother Kendall, that his heart, that his burden, that his desire is not just left the Jews because he went to the Gentiles, but he still is desiring and wishing that they would finally get it. Who are Israelites? to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises. Whose are the fathers? And of whom is as concerning the flesh Christ came, who is over all, God blessed forever. Amen. Now I'm going to give you a lot of breakdown on this right now, but I want you to look at that very last verse. Uh, there's a, there are more than one people in the world, even religious folks, uh, that try to say that Israel is not God's chosen and blessed people. But that last line says uh, they are blessed by God forever. Now what this means, what this passage of Scripture is meaning to us, and I know that it's a little bit wordy, okay? Paul was called to be an apostle to the Gentiles, but he still has a deep desire for salvation to come to the Jews who are his own flesh and blood, his people. The Israelites to whom were the original children of God by birth, by being born in the lineage of Abraham, they were the chosen people of God. To whom pertaineth the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises of whom are the church fathers. They're the ones that found, the ones that received the Holy Ghost in the beginning were Jews. Peter, James, and John, all the disciples, Mary, the mother of Jesus and his brethren, around 120, they were all Jews of whom Jesus Christ came in the flesh and he is over all and they are blessed of God forever. Now we've got to realize that Paul is declaring, Brother McKinney, who the Jews really are. They are the people of God. They are the true apple of his eye. They are the ones the promises came to, the covenants came to, the blessings came to, the lineage came to. It was, my God, it was of them that Jesus Christ was born. The Jesus was a Jew. He was born of their lineage. 
And Paul said, my heart is breaking. Because for, my Lord Jesus, help me right now. But be, be, in spite of all these blessings, they still don't know him. Paul's heart's desire and prayer for Israel is that they might be saved. In a manner of speaking, and I want you to understand, I, I believe there's one way to salvation. But Brother Robbie, I think it's fair to say that the Jews need to be twice saved. I'll explain that. The first thing is, is they need to be saved from their sins. Right? Everybody needs it. That's the mission of Jesus Christ. That's what he came for. You shall bring forth a son and call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Matthew 1 and 21. But then they also need to be saved from tradition, and they need to be saved from the self-righteousness that has been fatal to even Jesus' attempts to reach them. If you don't see a need, then the solution is unnecessary. Can I say that one more time? If you don't see a need for something, then the answer means nothing to you. Brother Robbie, they did not see a need for Jesus Christ, the humble son of a carpenter. So he healed, so he delivered, so he blessed. You know what that... I want you to hear me right now. I, I'm, this is... This is I don't know if I want to say it's deep or not, but this is, this is pretty rich what I'm trying to share with you this morning. Feelings couldn't keep them, Brother Robbie. Feeling of being hit, of blind eyes even be open, of dead people walking out of a tomb, of leprosy being cleansed, of seeing Jesus walk on the water, on the, on the crest of the waves, of seeing Jesus take one little lunch, one little sack, one little boy's lunch, and fed 5,000. They saw it come out of the boy's basket. They saw him take one boy's lunch, bless it, and begin to break it. And it grew, and it grew, and it grew. They experienced that, Brother Rice. They experienced the, the multitude of blessings. Wilt thou be made whole? Take up your bed and walk. They experienced a, a whole. you, you got to remember, there was one place, the house was so crowded, nobody else could get in there. So they let a man sick of the palsy, a paralytic, down through the roof. And everybody saw him be healed. But yet, when it came time, even scroungy old, wimpy old pilot gave them an out and said, whether of the twain do I release to you? Brother, Brother David, I feel like that he got the scroungiest crook out of jail he could find. A no good for nothing rascal, a noted robber, no telling what all else. Barabbas, well known among the people, and Jesus. I think, Brother Robbie, that he was hoping that they would let Jesus go because they sure enough couldn't let this rascal go. But what did they say? Give us Barabbas. Then Pilate said, well, what do you want me to do with Jesus? And what did they say? Now, I don't want to burst anybody's bubble. I don't want to upset anybody's apple cart. But I love to have worship in church. I love to have fast music. And I love to feel the presence of the Lord. Man, we singing that song today. I felt, boy, I felt the power of the Holy Ghost. Man, I felt something. But guess what? The music ends. And you know what, Brother David? Come on, I want y'all to stay with me this morning. What I'm preaching about this morning will keep young people. What I'm preaching about this morning will keep our elders. What I'm preaching about this morning will take mediocre saints and put them in a place of service to the king of kings. They never realized, they never knew who Jesus really was. As religious as they were, as blessed as they were, 
I got to tell you, the, the Lord has dealt with me strongly about this this week. We have got to get rid of our emotional walk with God. Because let me tell you, when it comes time, and I felt I, I could almost see it, Brother Robbie, this morning I could almost see it, Brother Terry, when we will have to stand up in the face of a negative crowd and declare that Jesus is Lord. There won't, I want you to hear me right now, there won't be no music. There won't be no church service. You say, well, it's, I'm not talking about the end times. I'm talking about something God wants to do through you. I'm talking about when your whole family's gathered together at the bedside of a loved one and you're the only believer amongst them. I'm talking about at a family reunion when somebody will begin to attack the, the integrity of the doctrine that you know to be true. I'm talking about on the workplace when they gather around your cubicle and begin to, to uh, demean and belittle that there even is a God. And then you're going to have to stand up and be able to declare with all authority that what you believe and what you live is true. And whether there's one person that agrees with you, you will leave as you came, solid and rooted and standing upon a firm foundation of knowledge of who Jesus is. Paul is aware of where the Jews are. Remember in the life of the Apostle Paul, he himself has been, Brother Terry, right where these Jews are. He was a zealot. He was an elitist. He felt like that he was the only one on the face of the earth that had a relationship with God. And that, that this man Christ Jesus and, and the work of this man was heresy and blasphemy. And he disagreed with it vehemently. Until one day a light shined down on him on the road to Damascus. And Paul's life would never be the same. He declared in his own words... I abused, mistreated, and persecuted this movement above everybody. I was the chiefest of sinners. I know where you are. Now, we got to understand something here. We, many times, get our viewpoint of the Jews from the Old Testament and from the New Testament kind of messed up a little bit. The Jews never worshipped idols. Please stay with me. Please stay with me this morning. Okay, please stay with me. I know there's a lot of stuff going on in your mind, and I know you've got a lot of things to do, but what I'm telling you this morning will absolutely change your life forever if you get a hold of it. Brother David, the Jews have not worshipped idols. They have not worshipped false gods since the Babylonian captivity, since they came back from exile. There is no mention in the New Testament of Jewish people worshiping idols. They are worshiping to the best of their ability the true God. They have remained true to Jehovah. But their dedication is not built upon revelation but upon tradition. Their dedication is built upon what has been passed down to them by word of mouth as opposed to the infilling of the Holy Ghost. Without recognizing Him for who He is, they for certain can't recognize Him as the Redeemer and Savior, nor give Calvary the proper place that it deserves in the pursuit of salvation, which is at the forefront. Their zeal, their enthusiasm, their fervent, exuberant behavior toward the Lord is not according to knowledge. Their zeal, I want somebody to hear me right now. Their zeal is rooted in tradition. And the pitiful truth, the heart-wrenching, heartbreaking truth is 
that the focus of their zeal, which is the Messiah, the anointed one, God, help me right now, the deliverer, the king, the, the, the great, wonderful Lord and Savior. That's the focus of their zeal. The pitiful truth is, he has come already. And they missed out because of a lack of knowledge. They missed out because of a lack of revelation. Notice he strongly says they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. So there is a zeal for God. Hear me right now. There is a zeal, a fervency, an urgency, a demonstrative activity in serving God that is according to knowledge. I lost you. Let me back up real quick. They have an enthusiasm for serving God, but not according to knowledge. There is an excitement, an enthusiasm, and an exuberance then that is according to knowledge. It's not about a feeling, it's about what you know. Ignorance is real. Ignorance is a lack of knowledge, and in some cases, it's a lack of wisdom to accompany what knowledge we have. Hence the instruction that Jesus gave his disciples. Be ye wise as serpents and harmless as doves. I remember daddy used to, to have a saying. And, and he was smarter than just most of the rest of us. But he said there are some people that have just enough knowledge to be dangerous. Now you remember, I hope you remember, you better remember, if you don't, I'm quitting right now on the spot, at least for today. A few weeks ago, I preached a message called Running with the Big Dogs. Thankfully, a couple remembered it. Brother Roger gave that CD to a Catholic lady. She now thinks that I'm close thing to Apostle Paul. She, Brother Pete, she thinks I'm bad to the bone, doesn't she? She told me at jail, she said, that's a message I can't listen to one time. I'm going to have to listen to it three or four times. But running with the big dogs... And I made a statement that said, how can you expect to run with the big dogs if you can't win the battle in your own backyard? It's because we try to, to step out and, and wage in spiritual warfare with just about that much knowledge. We think we get a, good, a little burst of, of something and we get a little feeling of something and we're ready to go whoop Goliath. That's what happened to the seven sons of Siva. They weren't necessarily, they weren't necessarily uh, uh, bad people. They just wanted the benefits of the authority and power of the Holy Ghost without accepting it. Right? Seven of them take on one fella. They said, we adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preacheth. The devil said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? Then he whooped all seven of them, stripped their clothes off of them, and ran them out of the house naked with their tail tucked between their proverbial legs. The reason why many of us, uh, we, we cannot get on solid, God help me in the Holy Ghost right now. Why we can't get on solid ground and good solid footing uh, is we're trying to run before we're ever even able to walk. You've got to get yourself rooted and grounded so you know what it takes to be saved. Praise the Lord for that. I got to go, man. I got to get in the Word. This is about a six-hour sermon I got to try to get done in 20 minutes. In this case with Israel, their ignorance, I want you to just please hear me right now. Their ignorance 
was given birth to in rebellion. It was a willful ignorance. They knew who they were, and they were right in knowing who they were, the children of God. But because Jesus didn't fit their idea of what a Messiah should be, they refused to accept Him for who He was. Ignorance, now hear me right now. I already established ignorance ain't a cuss word. And I've already proved to you there are things I'm ignorant about. There are things in this gospel, in the Bible that I'm ignorant about. Brother Robbie, that's why i got to keep studying. That's why i got to keep calling people and talking to people and keep learning. I want to be a student of the Word of God and of the things of God until I take my last breath. Ignorance can be crippling and otherwise debilitating for someone who desires more of God. And a strong desire for more of God cannot function without an equal desire for knowledge. Because God is not an irresponsible parent and He will not give you something that you can't handle just because you want it. That's why the Bible says plainly, and this is not in my notes, uh, but the Bible says study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. The Bible says, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. There's got to be something that gets in your heart. There's got to be something that gets in your mind that's bigger than anything you can feel, good, bad, ugly, or indifferent. Got to be a knowledge that gets in our spirit, that gets in our heart, that there's nothing in the world that can take it away. There's nobody. You cannot tell me that there's one human being. It's evident by the fact that he gave his life for the gospel. Nobody was able to take away what Paul experienced on the road to Damascus. And the Bible says, and I don't want to get into it in depth, but immediately he conferred not with flesh and blood. But he began to pursue a relationship with God. There's sometimes, man is not out here this morning. But there's been many times, I don't study at home so much, I guess I need to go back to doing it. I study down here. Because all my kids are nuts. They really are. I'll be glad when they make it through this stage, man. My goodness. No, I hope I make it through it. (laughs) But there will be times, I want you to hear something right now. Say, well, it's just because you're a preacher. I want to throw that out the window right now. There's a relation. You may never preach your first sermon. But there's a relationship with God that he desires you to have where the power of revelation operates. I've told you all, I don't think you believe me, but I'm going to keep telling you, there are things in that book I don't understand. And there'll be a passage of Scripture or two that I'll come up on that I don't understand. It's terribly frustrating, but I'll pray over it. I've laid the Bible open. I've told you all this before. I laid the Bible open, and I pray over it. And I read it, and I read it. Sometimes I've reread it 20 times, Brother David. Read the scriptures before it. Read the scriptures after it. Get out commentaries. Get out Bible dictionaries. Look it up on the internet for goodness sakes. Facebook is not the only book you can get references for on the internet. But I'll I'll be sitting at the table with my Bible open and all of a sudden, oh my goodness. Woo! Oh, my goodness. And Amanda will come in and say, what's the matter? I mean, this has happened. What's the matter? I said, it's right there. It was there all the time. Well, I feel the Holy Ghost right now. I'm trying to encourage somebody to sink the old plow. You know, I like to call that middle buster searching. We used to put that old middle buster behind that 8N Ford down at the boys' ranch. And you could sink it as deep as you wanted to sink it. Put that thing down in grandma and ease off the clutch. 
and she would dig deep. I'm talking about some middle buster searching. Some searching for some revelations in your life and in the life of others. I'm talking... I'm talking about some answers to some problems you've been having. I'm talking about some solutions. I'm talking about some strength to climb up the mountain. I'm talking about everything you need is in that book. Let me say it one more time. Everything you need is in that book. And ignorance is not bliss. Boy, I didn't really want to say this, but I'm going to go ahead and say it. We've had several people filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Some of them have stuck with us and some of them haven't yet, but they're going to stick. And we have some dynamic throwdown church. I got a couple other things. I just, well, while I'm out here, I just, well, let it run. We put the horse back in the stable. You can't untake him out. We got to be a worshiping church. We're setting down way too much. We got to be a worshiping church. We got to have dynamic church. But there has been, there has been a hesitancy over about the last three or four services. There has been a kind of like a couple years ago I had to deer hunt and I had to walk all the way in and all the way out and it had rained. And Brother Pete, I know you know what it's like walking in an old gumbo and your feet get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Y'all know what I'm talking about? You start off with your shoes like this and every few feet you have to kick your foot up in the air and you'll throw off a big old clod. Y'all know what I'm talking about? That's what it feels like in the spirit. We're making progress and things are doing good. And I got a letter in the mail this week. Uh, the Lord dealt with me up at the deer camp and he dealt with me again this morning. Sometimes we just want to, I'm guilty. What I'm about to tell you, I'm guilty. If you all will step out of your pew and run the aisles, we'll do it every service. And I love it. If you'll dance, if you'll shout, if you'll just get blow up excited every service, I'll let you. Because I love it. Brother Billy, I love it when people are dancing and shouting and talking in tongues and folks getting filled with the Holy Ghost. But the Lord dealt with me, Brother David. I'm not interested in swelling growth. The Lord is not interested in swelling growth. You say, well, what's swelling growth? Same thing happens when your ankle swells up. Guess what? It goes back down. But the Lord has dealt with me. I feel the power of the Holy Ghost on me right now, strong. That if we're not careful, we'll become adrenaline, emotional junkies, and nobody will ever gain anything. And the first devil you come against will whoop your behind, and you'll feel defeated and be lost. Unless, unless you've got some knowledge down inside of you. Because there may be a time, it has happened to me lately, when you don't feel right, when you don't feel good, when you feel like you're struggling. You might even be sick in your body. Amen. But the Holy Ghost ain't sick. The Holy Ghost ain't feeling bad. The Holy Ghost ain't feeling discouraged. And every time you go through a valley, don't mean you're backslid. Every time you go through a trial, don't mean you're backslid. But the Lord's wanting to work through you and the way he operates. Uh, you think we get up here and preach every time feeling on top of the world? No. Sometimes I get up here and don't feel worthy to be up here. But you know what I'm preaching from, Brother Peter? I'm not preaching from feeling. I'm preaching from knowledge. I'm preaching from the Spirit of God that says if you just keep on, if you just keep on, I'm with you. I'll be there. I found you. That's not a feeling anymore. I know my Redeemer liveth. I know my sins have been, whoa, my sins have been washed away. I have been pure and holy in the image of God. I know. I 
I know I'm not where I'm going to be, but I also know I'm not where I've been. I know. I know I have a zeal for God, but it's more than a feeling. It's more than a new cool song. It's why sometimes uh, when Brother Terry gets up uh, and the first notes, uh, and he says, oh, Lord, my God. And I feel whoosh. When I, in awesome wonder, consider all the works thy hands have made. Oh, it don't have to be a new song. It don't have to be a cool song, Brother Peter. And I love them. I like them. I like the new stuff. Uh, but oh, uh, there's something uh, that's not just the old songs, uh, Brother Robbie, because I don't have to be in church. Uh, I don't have to be in church. I sing all the time. Oh, the pure delight uh, of a single hour when before thy throne I spend, uh, when I kneel in prayer and with thee, my God, uh, I commune as friend with friend. Uh, and I feel the power of the Holy Ghost. Because I know my Jesus is with me. I know my Lord is with me. How do I know it? Because the book says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you, but I'll go with you always, even unto the end of the world. My walk with God is rooted in more than a feeling. My walk with God, I want you to hear me right now. My walk with God is rooted in more than having some fun activities to do. My walk with God is rooted in knowledge that was given birth to at my daddy's knee but there was a hunger placed in me to begin to seek and to search and to find what God desired for me and I've got to convince you I've got to help you I've got to encourage you you've got a zeal for God or you wouldn't be here this morning Hope I don't stroke out there, Roger. Roger said when he first saw that Amanda put on, I was at the hospital last Sunday morning. He said, I know he done preached himself into a stroke. <laughs> they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. I want you to know something. I'm not talking necessarily, my God in mercy. I'm not talking necessarily about the type of knowledge that comes the same way you were taught reading, writing, and arithmetic. As a rule, we Pentecostals enjoy church in high gear. And as a pastor, we're prone to desire that, that allows our services we are prone to desire that our services are bumping and thumping all the time. Amen. Praise God. And I agree. It's these services that get people excited. And continually having them leads to growth. Don't misunderstand me. I am supremely excited over our growth. New people coming to know the Lord through the power of the Holy Ghost is the defining characteristic of a revival church. We got to have people filled with the Holy Ghost every service. However, we're not interested in only having a bigger number. But we're seeking for individual growth, which will add to the body, causing collective growth. And this growth comes through revelation, which once revealed becomes knowledge. And with obedience to what you now know comes growth. Brother Shannon, I'm going to have to cut my scriptures close. Give me 1 Corinthians 2 and 9 and 10. But as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. <clears throat> Verse 10. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit, for the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. 
They are revealed to us by his spirit. There are deep things the Lord wants to reveal to us. There are places that the spirit goes, and that's where the Lord desires to take us. Give me verse 16, Brother Shannon. Is it up there? Yeah, 2 and 16. For who hath known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we, but we, everybody say we, not they, not them, not used to be, but we have the mind of Christ. What does that mean, that we have the mind of Christ? Monday night in prayer meeting, and I pray through the tabernacle. That's my plan. I very rarely get done. Very rarely get done. But I begin to think about having the mind of Christ. And I begin to pray. I want you to hear me right now. I begin to pray that I learn to love like Jesus loved. That I learn to love people like Jesus loved them. That I learn to see people, to think about people with the mind of Christ as opposed to the mind of the flesh. Give me 2 Peter chapter 1, Brother Shannon, verse 1 through 8. And I'm going to finish with this. <clears throat> Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Verse number three. According... I don't know how it is nowadays, but back in the good old days when I was going to school, teachers took pride in the fact that their students learned something. Right. And, and, and I don't want to get into no political discussion, but Kara can probably relate. Whitney, this was a long time before no child left behind. And if we didn't learn it, we stayed there until we learned it. Nowadays, they have to just keep going. Right? <laughs> well, good. We, the good. You stay there. And you stay there. And what happens is when we begin to blow and go at church, we just totally miss out on knowledge. And that's why Brother Cunningham told us this, and I, and I, want, to, I want to share it with you. If, if you work a job that is, that is, that is strenuous or that, that is time-consuming or if you have a lot of things going on through the week that I, I can't think of what it could be that's more important than learning the Word of God. But if you have to make a choice that you can only attend part of church, Wednesday nights needs to be the one night you do attend. Because shouting and dancing won't keep you. David said, his word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against God. It's the word, Brother McKinney, that's going to save us. It is the word of God getting embedded in you. That's I didn't say that. Brother Cunningham did. Brother Jack Cunningham, one of the most dynamic church church. Church growth experts in our movement. According as his divine power. You know what? I, I ain't the smartest, sharpest knife in the drawer. I need somebody. Maybe I don't read very good. Who, who has enough gumption to hold the microphone and read this scripture for me? Who will do it for me? Brother Terry, I, I really was looking for somebody else. I mean, you, you, 
Do you know how to read? Yeah, I can read. read that scripture for me. Read it slow. According as his divine power. Hold up. According as his divine power. Happy. It don't come from a Cracker Jack box. It don't come from a TV. It don't come from a computer. It don't come from Dr. Norman Vincent Van Peel or Max Licato or John Maxwell's books. It comes from heaven. According as his divine power. Read it. Hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and God. Hold up. Back up. According, read it again, all the way down to that first comma. According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. Read it one more time. According as his divine power hath given unto us all things, all things that pertain un <laughs> unto life and godliness. Unto life? What is that? What is life? Eating, sleeping, drinking, relationships, holding down a job, everything that you do in life, and what's godliness? Our walk with God. How to live in the how to live in the world and how to live for God. I mean, I might be messing up, but I think it says all things. Thank you there, Reverend King. <laughs> Through I'm about to get done. I know I've gone over. The time I set for myself. Nobody set me that time. I did it for myself. So I can change it if I want to. According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. Just because you got the Holy Ghost doesn't mean you have all the knowledge you need to live for God. But it is the Holy Ghost. I remember Brother Manning used to quote this quite often when we went to Tally to church. The Spirit will lead and guide you into all truth. The book has given you everything you need to make it. But let me tell you something. It does not just jump out of there and slap you in the head. You have got to search. You have got to dig. Eyes not seen. Ears not heard. Neither have entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for them that love him. Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises. By these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. For if these things be in you, and abound, what? I know I've gone over. God help me. <laughs> For if these things be in you, how do they get in you? Come on. They get in you. They're placed in you when you receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. You learn to let them out through the acquired knowledge of what the Lord wants for you. That be in you, when you're filled with the Holy Ghost, these things that are in you, then you've got the option whether to let them win or the lust of the flesh win. But if these things be in you 
and abound. That means you're showing them out. You're the light of the world. A city set up on a hill cannot be hid. Show your light before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Let your light so shine before men that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful. In the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to go back here and pick on Kara again. It does those kids no good. For, I don't even know if y'all have chalkboards anymore, dry erase boards. Y'all probably even got computers now. I don't know. But it does no good for you to tell those children two and two give you four. Or five and five give you ten. Unless, I, I, Carly brings home these papers all the time. You know what they say? You know what they say on top of them? Every one of them? Starts with a P. You're getting close. Practice. Practice, 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 practice. And when you practice enough, teach, you can go on to algebra or trigonometry or calculus or physics, but you cannot go there without learning two and two give you four. Huh? I feel so much Holy Ghost right now. I could just go on and preach my sermon for tonight that I don't even have together yet. Let's stand. My prayer and my desire for the First Pentecostal Church of New Madrid is that you be saved. You will not be saved based upon a feeling. You will only be saved by what you know. Because feelings end. You might get a cold. You might get a belly ache. You might have an ingrown toenail. You might have a headache. Sinus infection. Your kids may not mind. You may have the rent due and no money. <laughs> Repo man's on his way to get your car. Or your truck. Or maybe both. Nowadays, the repo man may be on the way to get your washer and dryer and your TV and your microwave. They're coming. But the Spirit of God within you, the knowledge of who Jesus is, the knowledge of what the book says, that all things that pertain unto life and godliness are available. You say, well, I'm not that good at learning. That's why it don't come. I didn't get to go into it, Brother Robbie, but the book said that this knowledge that you're going to get of God.